Hi guys, so where we stay now? We are in Pittsburgh, which is in Pennsylvania. It's uh, it is just an overfly country, or yeah, yeah. So it, no, actually, we live. You're in Mars, believe it or not. And that's Mars. Yes. This is think. Mars, Pennsylvania. We're slightly north of Pittsburgh, and it's actually not named after the planet. It's named after General Mars, but everybody thinks we're the planets because our high school name are the Fighting Planet. So everybody thinks this is named after the planet. It's not. <laughs> but when you tell people you're Mike from Mars, they look at you like you're weird. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just found it when we booked the flights and uh, look at the hotel, and I give Pittsburgh in, and it's uh, Mars. And so, okay, okay. Uh, but uh, let us drive there. Yep. So we drive yesterday from New York uh, to over New Jersey. We take the south route because uh, unfortunately we had some snowstorms, which make it quite funny to drive over the Appalachian. Yeah. Uh, the mountains are the mountains. tricky when it snows. Yeah, but a, a really nice trip. Oh, yeah. So it took a little bit longer as expected. And we make a small stop in Harrisburg, which oh, okay. was also quite good. Nice, had some good burgers. Yep, that's, a, that's the state capital of Pennsylvania is Harrisburg. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. So really, really No, it's nice. a beautiful drive. Yeah. In the spring and in the fall, it's even better. But it was the half was snowy and foggy, and we don't see anything. So, yeah, that's the like bad uh, our New York trip where we run around all the time in rain. It rains 24 hours. So, <laughs> and the next morning there's no more rain. But then we have to leave. So, yeah. <laughs> then we drive here yesterday. We are now one week around, and I'm so happy to be here because we are at Mike Paletta's house. We'll be invited, and I'm very proud that we can be here because Mike Paletta is the latest aquarist of the year. In last uh, Magna in Milwaukee, he was uh, he won this title, absolutely, because you a long time. Yep, and lifetime, some would say. <laughs> lifetime's work and work for the hobby, work for the reefers in the U.S. And that's a great thing. And I was very happy to hear that after so long time he do the work that he gets this title, absolutely. So and there we talk each other and say, okay, yep. come here, and that's what we do. Talking about the reef tanks, talk, uh, have a look around to all the stores. And to show a little bit, and that's why we do the interview today, what's the difference over the last 40 years, which we can say, 24 we will have also. Yeah, we've you been doing your this first reef 40 tank, years. 84. 84 is my first reef tank. I started to clean uh, reef glass in 84 in a... In a um, they don't we'll have child labor laws. See, I started my reef tank when I was two, so you must have been doing the reef tanks glass so when you were four. No late child labor laws. No, I want to earn money, you know. <laughs> so my father said to me, hey, you're 14, you have to earn money. Um, he pays only three bucks, and the guy with the, uh, with the store, the fish store, in my city, he pays five. So what can I do? I, I go to the fish store. Yeah, you're a capitalist. You know, you go where the money is. And, yeah. <laughs> This area where I live is well known for this, that we look, f we look for that uh, a little bit better than other cities, maybe. Um, no, so I cleaned some million square miles of glass. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, but it was a good luck for me because we learned a lot of things to the situation that I was in the wholesale. And we're one of the first companies making a lot of imports from Hawaii, from Indonesia, starting with a few soft corals, right. uh, some button polyps. And the yellow soantos, which you never oh, see Oh, yeah, you today. don't see those anymore because yeah. they burn anything they get near. Yeah, but they, but they were nice. Oh, they're beautiful. So, and, um, that was one of my first corals, too. The yellow zoanthus. We had only these five. <laughs> oh, we had those leather corals, bubble coral. You would get an occasional goniaporas, and we thought those were good corals because we thought we were keeping them alive. The reality was they simply died slower than the other corals. Uh, it's still to date, but the most people, the corals still died over months and not grow like that. So, yeah. so that's why we still write and give information out. And that's what, what Mike Paletta do all the time, taking, uh, taking talks, um, writing books, writing articles around, work for some companies there to explain to people how to use the product. So for there, I'm very proud to be here. Now, I'm glad to have you, Claude. It's always good to have friends visit. When was your first reef tank? When, how you start with that? What was in this time? So the typical things, our knowledge to say, we have a reef tank now. So which light, which skimmer, how we work? This 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 is a, an interesting story. I started my first fish tank when I was five. My cousin gave me her guppy tank, and that kept me going. And then that Christmas, my parents bought me a ten-gallon tank. So I always had fish since I was five years old. In 1967. 
I was eight, my father bought me Jacques Cousteau's book, Life and Death in the Coral Sea. <laughs> if you ever saw that book, it's the first picture book that showed color photos of what a reef looked like. And it had a Moorish idol and a regal angel as one of the main pictures in it. When I saw that, that's what I knew I wanted to have someday. Ten years later, maybe 12 years later, in the late 70s, my father was traveling in Germany. And he knew I always had fish tanks, so he would always walk around and see pet shops and stuff. He walked by a store, and they had, as best as he knew, something different than what he'd seen in my tank. So he walks in, and they said, yeah, this is a reef tank. And this is the book we're following, and it was Jürgen Lemkemeyer's The Modern Marine Aquarium. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll bring that back for my son. So he brought it back. I do not speak German. I do not translate German. Over the next four or five years, with the help of German friends of mine and a German dictionary, I translated the book from German into English. So in 1983, 84, or 1982, I got my first saltwater tank. Mm -hmm. In 1984, I'd finally had this book done. It had a trickle filter. It had what live rock was. <laughs> it had you needed more light than a single fluorescent tube. I started my own reef tank. I got these 5,000K metal halide lights, and I rigged them up. Yeah. from Kmart, they ran about 10,000 degrees temperature-wise, and if you'd splash water on them, they would blow up, and if you dropped them in the tank, they'd catch on fire. So I did that over time. I wrote to Hawaii, because that was the only place I could think of for live rock, because I saw this ad in a magazine that this guy was selling zoanthids and other things. And he goes, what do you mean live rock? I said, the dead coral skeletons. I don't want the corals. I want the rock that the corals have made. Yeah, but that was usual with the dead corals. Yeah. The dead corals it was, was dead. absolutely usual at this time to do the decorations yep. and, and press the tank full of rocks. Yeah, <laughs> so this guy thought I was nuts, but he sent me a box of live rock, quote-unquote live rock. What it had in it were the most beautiful zoanthids I have ever seen. They were bright cherry red with bright blue centers. They would probably sell for $1,000 a piece now in the U.S. Never saw them again other than to ship it. That was my start of having a, a, an aquarium. And I was working in sales, and I worked five states mm -hmm. where I drove. And I knew every pet shop in those five states, which probably was about six or 700 square miles. This shop in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where you were, which is interesting that you mentioned that, I would drive there. And that's about a three-hour drive from here. They would call me and say, we got in a coral. They would get in all their boxes of fish, and then to fill up a box, they would throw in a coral or two. They would call me because I was always pestering them, and I would go and pick up the coral. The first two corals I got was a bubble coral that I paid $100 for and a leather coral that I paid $30 for. That was my first start of a I reef think, tank. I think we did 82, 83, we did not have a lot of these bubbles or SP, no. uh, SPS coming later. That a I SPS remember. came in in 92. But at the beginning, the first, uh, the first imports what we had was a lot of leather stuff. Yep. Um, and we used um, from Mr. Knopp, Daniel Knopp, you know Yep, I know Daniel. He, he built at this time some skimmers and some filter stuff, which we had, our company had the distribution for that. And so we used a lot of these, with this wooden air, wooden, wooden air stones. Wooden air stones, right, the English one. Um, that was the standard, but uh, Soantos we had only the Indonesian stuff, so it was impossible to get cords from Hawaii or from other areas there. Right. Till around shortly before the 90s, when the first SPS coming. Yep, from Fiji, from uh, no, Walt they, Smith, and yeah, that's but where that we got our also from. in the 90s, but in the 80s were Indonesian stuff. Okay, yeah. So, and there come the first Acroporas coming, and I remember so good, it must be also 85, 86, I never... See, here they didn't get here till about... Uh, 89 90 and they used to go uh, if you drove were driving through New Jersey you went near yeah. Stroudsburg Pennsylvania there was a guy named Ed yeah. that was a four-hour drive for me I would drive to Ed's because he would get in ten boxes of soft corals and he would get one or two Acropora Acropor. or stony corals I would drive there and pick those up and bring them home <laughs> no I, I remember to pack out one and uh, tap on it and say hey boss it's, it's hard yeah so oh yes it's a uh, Acropora maybe is it okay where we put it so, and we had a lot of tanks full of soft cores, but <laughs> typically to this time we said, oh, this was the tank with the green hair all cheese, put there, because green hair also means we have perfect water. <laughs> yeah. So, and um, the filters were filled up with uh, coral gravel, right. with about a half a ton of carbon, 
because you know carbon was was the uh, and yep. skimmer yep. and some egg rates egg rates we still had since yeah. this time so and then we put the acropora inside and the next few days it turns to white and asking the boss again hey it is normal that they turn the coloration yeah <laughs> and uh, Yes, the 90s or so, then coming the Fiji stuff, so that be, that starting then become a very popular. But, you know, on the other side, the Balling method, yeah, like this, starting 94. So it was published the first time. So there was a guy, uh, Pavlovsky was there yep. in Europe. He developed this system and was being then described by Hans Werner, a colleague from mine. Uh, Hans Werner Balling dis described this about it, but we are in this time, we were full in the aquarium industry. So we had stores building up tanks and growing up there. And there I said at this time, it's, it's, uh, the system is quite nice, but it's wrong. Got it using by theoretical things. And so I decided there to search my own system to develop because we built a large, uh, a huge tank um, in this uh, store where I worked then later. Right. About uh, 15,000 gallons around it has. No, not 15, 10,000 gallons it has in this time. And so we had no catching reactors, nothing. No. So, and even for cut water, it was too big. Yeah. So yeah. that I choose, then we choose the calcium chlorides and carbonates and, and put it in, in, in tons in the daily. See, see, during those years, we were much, much further behind you. We were waiting for articles from Alf Nilsson and Svein Fossa, which were coming in FAMA. Yeah. And then uh, Dietrich Stuber wrote some articles in AFN magazine. That's what got everybody into this, is those articles. We would literally sit and wait for the mailman to bring the magazine with the latest update on what we did. There was no magazine in the U.S.? There was nothing. There were no books on this. There was nothing you could get. The closest thing I had, I told you, I translated a book. I did the translation and I gave the translation to Julian Sprung, John Burleson, and Charles Delbeck. Yeah. That's what got us excited. We used to talk to but each they other. They came after, right? They came after. But this is, we were waiting for these magazines because these magazines were like the holy grail explaining the secrets of how to do this. We had no idea and we had none of that equipment. We used to build our own skimmers. We started off with actually the Dutch mini reef system where we built trickle filters and yeah. we had to build them ourselves. Trickle and then Dupla stuff. came to the US and they supplied trickle filters. Then a bunch of companies started making trickle filters. And then Stuber and uh, Nielsen wrote their articles and saying, don't use trickle filters, use protein skimmers. The only protein skimmers we had were the little crappy plastic sander skimmers that were like this big. The sanders. We, yeah, we had nothing big enough to handle this tank. Yeah, but, but even Knopf sent some to U.S. then later. That, this so. is after that. All of us after. I, I so learned to build a protein skimmer and I find big air pumps. I would build five foot tall Schedule 80 PVC pipe skimmers. They would take everything. I, I mean, they worked phenomenally well. They were expensive to build at the time, but they worked like crazy. Nobody uses air-driven skimmers anymore, but they worked really, really well. well we worked long. We, uh, we tuned them, so we add more. You know, I was a carpenter. My, my family is at a carpentry. So for me, what's really easy to build uh, these wooden air stones, and then we drill and we make more on it because these huge tanks need huge yeah, skimmers. Big skimmers. That was the first what I used. They were sander. And there was Knopf, and we worked with the Knopf skimmer. So the Sander ones was, at this time, for me, it was too small. Yeah. Because um, nowadays, maybe today, nobody's understand, but nowadays an aquarium had, had to have a size. Right. So then uh, a was big no tank was 50 gallons. 40 gallons was considered a big tank. If you did a 90, you had a monstrosity. No, all our tanks had way more than 200. We had nothing like that until This the was an aquarium. All others is not an aquarium. All others is... Uh, However, you call them nano tanks. They call today, but we don't talk, yeah. call them. Uh, no, my first tank. tank was 120 gallons. I got that in. Uh, no, I started off actually with a, a 60 gallon. Then I moved to the 120 when I moved to my house in Greensburg. Two years or 18 months later, I changed that to a 240 gallon tank. I then moved out here, and I changed that 240 gallon tank into a 540 gallon tank. That lasted for another five years. Then I custom built myself a 1,200 gallon tank from scratch, getting the glass, gluing it and everything else. Yeah. That lasted for 10 years. Then I moved over to here. My ex-wife killed off the 1,200 gallon tank. What I could salvage from there, I put in a 300 gallon tank down there. And then I moved the 300 gallon tank to the 500 gallon tank three plus years ago. So how many tanks overall? 
one. Oh, there were also tanks that went with that. When I had the 1200, yeah. I also had a 240. When I had the uh, 500, I had a 200. So I've probably had 20 tanks over my career. And what do you think which were the best one now? The best or, uh, one, uh, no, the 540 I had uh, before the 1200. It was full, and when I say full, it was packed with corals. It had four metal halides and two blue actinic light bulbs over it. Philips, you take also? Yeah. The TL03? Yep. Nobody knows them today. Philips TL03, 140 watts, making a violet actinic lighting. Yep. Um, if, you, if you want to change the bulb and you cut off the energy, you have to wait around a minimum two hours before you can uh, touch it, or it burns your, burns your fingers, fingers yeah. on the glass. Yep. <laughs> it was hot. Oh, like it was hell. hot. <laughs> that was that was the problem with the lighting then. It was all ran red hot. That's why yeah. LEDs came into the Vogue. They don't burn everything. Yeah, the LED stuff is okay at the end. I see now that uh, metal halide coming back. So uh, many things come back, which was 20 years before was absolute standard. Yep. And now it's stuff coming back. And sometimes I think also cog water and stuff there. And sometimes I think, uh, why the heck this stuff come back? So we, we develop new things to make it better. And it shows that we could do it better if we keep today corals, which you never think about. Right, NPS corals, Gorgonians. And now they go back and taking stuff like cork water again. Right. And it is, for me, it's to coming back. Well, one of the reasons it came back is a, a company here called Bulk Reef Supply yeah, I know. did a nice experiment showing higher pH versus lower pH. You get 25 to 40% faster growth in the higher pH. That's, trying to get yeah, your pH but, up, but the easiest not, way is compost. Yeah, but that's not true. I'm, I'm just going by their experiment. It's only that's one experiment, one, I know. But It's one experiment, which a lot of different things also play around. And it's the question over the time. We make stuff, when we work on there, we make things about time. A reef tank which runs one year, it's at the Still beginning. a baby, yeah. It's a baby. So uh, after one year, one and a half years, it becomes to be the stability. And that's what I learned over the, all the years now is that the art of reef keeping has nothing to do with do the artwork. The question is how long you can run it and keep it stable. And right. if, if you run high uh, pH, it has an effect on your chemistry and, if, and, and the corals. The one effect could be that they grow faster the one way. On the other side, you're losing a lot of elements and stuff, which creates a lot of problems half a year later. Right. So, and uh, that's uh, one thing for me changed is that today I have sometimes the feeling that I buy a reef tank and it has to work immediately within of two weeks. Uh, that, that, see that finished perfect and that's it that's the problem so. for a lot of people to, from my point of view under the age of 30 is they haven't learned what old reef keepers have that the two crucial things are this you can keep high nutrients you can keep a oh, crazy amount of fish you could have no fish the cr two critical things are patience and stability yeah patience is done and with patience everybody just working on their phone and immediate gratification yeah. This is not a hobby for people that need immediate gratification. You're not going to make a change and go, wow, that leather coral got this big overnight. That's never going to happen. But that leather coral could melt or that a cropper can totally bleach if you don't do things right or if you're yeah. impatient or if the tank's not stable. Or you change something and you think, oh, it's fine. Two weeks later is when the coral dies and you go, why did that die? I didn't do anything. In the well, you did this two weeks ago. It punishes you in time and people don't take that into account. Yeah, but that's what, what uh, we make a video, I think it's in German, but we have uh, subtitles now, which we call, this is the most difficult keep uh, pet what you can have. Oh, yeah. Corals. So, they're oh, yeah. the most difficult ones. They're the most nicest one, and it's uh, today with the technology and food stuff and absorbers and everything what we had, not that difficult, I think, like 20 years ago. Um, sometimes I miss... The situation that people say it becomes more complicated, it, it is the same like 20 years before. But what they forget, I think, is that we don't have this type of animal. This amount of different ones and these colorful ones. So there is a development in the last 20 years for me, definitely. Oh, also, yeah. when I see the difference between the European German uh, reef keeping to the US reef keeping. So um, it was a good thing that different type of technology is using 
in Europe, in America, and due to Facebook and Instagram and all things, people get more information each other. And what I like in the US so much is that you have from the east to the west coast the same language. Right. In Europe, we have so difficulties to bring groups and, and uh, reefers together due to the barrier language. Right. And um, I love the French people, but they don't like speak English. So I can speak French, that's not a big deal. Right. Uh, Portuguese, Spain, all these different languages becomes difficult. So only right. a small part of the reefers looking over the table and have a look on it, what is in the US and what not. Sometimes, in my opinion, many things will take f too fast and without think about then back to Europe and say, oh, let us make cold water. No, but the way how, they t how we treat the tanks, you don't need the cold water again. Maybe in winter time when the pH go low a bit, you, you can have them out. But at the same time, cold water, we don't use anymore because it's a sink for your elements and for your organic. It takes out your fluorine out and it creates so many problems when this is used because even the understanding to use it sometimes, right. a little bit, or use it all the time. That's a complete different thing. Right. And this is, uh, at the moment, for me, it's a little bit difficult that there's so much information. Now, right. before we don't have information, so we need to talk each other, and a meeting on shows, that was the only way to, to deal with information, with ideas, or um, magazines, like the core magazine in, right. in Europe. And now, we have tons of information where I think it makes for the, for the beginners more extremely difficult. difficult to find out which information I can use and which one is goes in the deep or is only marketing so which guys has a knowledge and which one not because one in my opinion one thing don't change it's still only a handful of people in each country which has really knowledge about what they do and they will never say it so cause a, a big part is experience right so and to learn how not to do it yeah and not how to do it <laughs> right it's like, it's like That's doing my point. a beautiful sculpture, you know what to leave out or take out rather than everything you have to put in. Because a lot of times, a lot of this information, you need to add this and this and this and this. Yeah. But the reality is, actually, you need to take some things out or leave things off, and it makes the tank better over time. Yeah, it makes it over time. So, I say always, reef keeping is for people which, is, um, which go fishing is, is too stressful. So, they need the reef tank. Because you have time for this and let them grow because it's a small biotope, a small habitat and you see your tanks, how different they are, yeah. even if they have the same water. Right. Like I see now you have G4, you have LEDs, you have metal halide, so you connect all the lamps together like we do, but we don't use any more uh, metal halides at our, because, um, you know, actually we pay for the power for one kilowatt hours, we pay about 40 cent. Yeah. When I calculate Andrew Sandler's uh, energy cost, what he tells me, yep. I say, okay, take it by eight, then you have our cost there. <laughs> Even here, have looks on it. Yeah, that would. Um, that's why in, I think the Germans, reefers, and companies looking very early to have extremely effective uh, products right. against on other countries where it was, it, it was not necessary about well, the cost. Well, like on this tank, the lights are on now about 10 hours a day. In the summer, they're on like four hours a day mm. because this gets much more sunlight. And, and as you saw earlier, when the sun hits this, it, you can't even tell these lights are on. So it's kind of stupid to have lights on when it's getting sunlight. Yeah, ben, but then you see how, how strong the light is. Oh, yeah, I see how but we still aren't even close to sunlight. Yeah. And this is under uh, protected from infrared light, so it doesn't heat the tank. These are nice skylights. But when it hits these corals, uh, a lot of these are small because, as I told you, I wiped this tank out last summer, so it's taken me six months to accumulate enough interesting soft corals to fill it. By the end of the summer, most of these soft corals will be this big because getting sunlight every day, they just explode in growth over the summer. Yeah, sure. I mean, it, 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 it's amazing to me. Sunlight is still the best light. I mean, as no, much as we, we try. cannot control it. No, that's our, we can't that's, control it. That's really, today, a big a problem, and that's also a bigger problem. For me, a problem for the metal halides. So... I like, I love this light. From the view, from the power, from the penetration of the light, I must say, for me, if you have the radiums, you know, uh, these 14K, yep. which we used earlier to 
to, yeah. to say which color we have. Yep. So we said the 10K, the 40K, and, and the, the 20K. Daylight. And, and the 20K, 20K. Yes. right, later then. Yeah, later. They come later. Yep. First was only daylight and 40K. Well, first was the 6500K Iwasaki's. We had uh, BLV. Okay, we had Iwasaki's. Yeah. Then we went to the 10Ks. Then we went to 14Ks, and it was like magic. And then they went to the 20Ks that, uh, when the radiums came in. And that was when people went nuts. Wow, look how colorful these corals are. That was a blue. Yeah, that was the blue. That was a blue. That was a blue light. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but we, but we are not able to control it anymore. So for that, I like the LEDs today where you can control it by each percentage. You can oh, yeah. play around with your spectra. If it's necessary, uh, no. So at the end, not. So no. And it creates sometimes more issues uh, with uh, you need different kind of traces. But this is a soft coral tank. It's very, I'm not worried about control as much for an SPS tank. I have put SPS in here. They all turn beige or brown. I've put the most colorful corals from downstairs up here, the Montiparas and Acros. They all turn beige or brown under the sunlight. Mm, I just had nothing to do with the sunlight. During the sunlight shines, they look a little bit more like this. But you can have with sunlight extremely colorful. Look what we talked oh, I, about I, before. I know, but in this tank, for whatever reason, I couldn't balance the chemistry and the sunlight. So yeah. they stay downstairs. I can balance them there under the blue lights. Under the blue lights under here, even though there's blue lights yeah, at night. That we can balance with ICP. That's working today. Well, I haven't done ICP on a soft coral tank. This is a fun tank. Yeah, why not? Because I'm not worried about it. It's uh, Everything's open. Everything's happy. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, I enjoy this tank. I'm not going to stress myself. I got enough stress downstairs. This is, I don't need stress on a soft coral <laughs> tank. I have my school of green chromis. I don't need, you know... No, this tank don't need it. Something crazy in even, here. Even your gorgonias looking nice. Yeah, the ones Gorgonia. in the back. Even the sea fan is still alive. Yeah. So. And that's a, high, that's a real high-end animal. Yeah. It's really difficult to keep them. Yeah. I know. So I'm, I'm very happy with this time. Yeah, but very rare to see in Germany, meanwhile. So due to COVID, we had an, an impact of the flights, which reduces uh, standard... Everything uh, coming in, yeah. yeah no, we had that for two years. There was literally nothing coming in. Also not? Because mm -mm. there were no flights in Indonesia, because it was basically... Yeah, but they, come, but they come from the Caribbean. That so. came from the Caribbean. That came from yeah. Julian. Hmm. Julian grows them, so... So what is for you today the biggest... Uh, development and reef keeping overall what uh, do you think is, is for I, I think it's the kind of work that Jamie Craig's is doing getting corals to spawn and then moving that into the big scale reef restoration because we all know how devastated a lot of the reefs are and if you can instead of fragging a coral and getting you know 10 offspring of it you can get them to spawn and have 10,000 offspring the next big test though is to get those 10,000 offspring and put them on a reef and see how well they do in a they will do well that's not a problem because that's a natural thing what the what the corals do i know but it's difficult to find somebody to implant ten thousand. i'm not sure me personally i'm quite not sure if this would be a sensible way um the protection of the reefs nowadays has uh, not that in my opinion that's my opinion not that much to do with the temperature the temperature by itself, of course, is not that big deal. No. They, uh, Calci they, our ice, our acidification and yeah. a reduction in wave movement. Just there's, there's just to see now that they can change the, the um, zooxanthellas inside. They use different ones which make them more, more heat. And right. corals cover it uh, uh, times where we have ice ages. We have the overall, over time, we look, for me at the moment, we look to specify on one year, two years. I see a lot of reefs which have, um, which have uh, El Nino effect, which was heated. And I go back two years later and it was completely fully covered. Yeah. The, the Great Barrier Reef now, it's more covered than the last 50 years. Right. The Maldives, when they had their major bleaching event, seven years later, it was basically completely back. Yes. The, my problem nowadays is more that there is too less view on things like uh, shrimp farming, like uh, oh, uh, the jungles will be cut it to, to get palm oil. Right. Uh, uh, which too much uh, development along the shores and just dumping sewage and other waste material yeah, right dumping, there. Dumping yeah, dumping stupid things in. So when we let them run a little bit, they can heal themselves way faster as we can do it. Because one of the major problems that we have to breed clams and corals also by that way some reefers doing that 10 years before that they get into spawn right jamie makes a great work now 
absolutely to find out exactly what, why these. And we have a guy, Samuel Nitzer, which is in Germany. He also worked on the type of bacteria which uh, the, the larvae correspondent okay. on the surfaces um, and how we can work that. I looked this a little bit overall due to my time on the Philippines when I had the time looking reef is over longer time is only half a year. Right. Um, it's the way how we bring the corals in, how they will settle there. Because, you know, a coral have a few seconds time when she hits a place where it's suitable for her in the perfect area, in the perfect height right. that she can start then to grow. I think it is way more easy to win the, the state uh, lottery than find the right place for coral. Once a year, every yeah. time, then to find a good place for a coral larvae. Yeah. So that, that's, uh, we have hundreds of trillions of billions of larvae, some of them floating around two, three years, and then they need to find such a small spot on point. And now we, we can transplant them and can bring them back. The question is, if it's the right place for this coral. And you know how difficult it is oh, I, yeah. to find a group. And I think also we have to accept that reefs are like forests, that they change over decades, starting as a mixing one. Right, and then you get monospeciation, where you, you only have one species. Exactly, then we have illness, then we have fires like in... Right, and we have pests that dominate one type of coral versus another. And two, three years, and, and, and one year later, then it's a burning, then all these, most, mostly not all died, but two years later, the forest regrows, right. but young. And then I must ask over the time if it's not a normal thing. And we look today, in my opinion, a little bit too deep on this one, and it's too political, instead of trying to find out what is the real situation? That the climate changes, we can feel it. That's not the point. We are, I'm, I'm not the guy who said, oh, come on, nothing happens. So right. Absolutely not. But when, when it's stated here today that the Great Barrier Reef is uh, at this point, it's dead, and my fisherman sends me a picture and says, like, I have no idea why they make the films. Yeah. This lying and these two strong political things did not help us to find good solutions, how to breed cores, how to bring it back, right. how to take care, because there's a need, and there's a good one that we don't need to burn gas and diesels around when we have others. It, the stuff is, is too value that we can use it on that way. Yeah, I agree with you yeah. completely. The, the, it has become too politicized, whether you keep fish or birds or cats and dogs. There's yeah. people that don't want you to keep anything. What those people don't understand is you show kids what a reef looks like, they want to protect it. They want to take care of a yeah, reef. But it educates and it, it helps the reef. And but nowadays, everybody says then they refuse it. But I see in the eyes of kids, and I see kids growing up in houses which have dogs and animals, they have another respect against all others. And this has nothing to do with an iPad, with an iPhone, or with a film. In my opinion, that's, I'm 51 now, maybe I'm too old for this, but uh, I see that all the time, how the kids are different. And that's why I, I think it's extremely important also for our fisherman's guy. This is not a big industry, the fisherman's catching fishes by a net. Yeah. No, it's a How you can distinct an animal with a net when you swim behind them? Yeah, you, I, I've been watching the guys collect them in Fiji. Yes. And to see how quick these guys are, they didn't have tanks. They were basically free diving with two little nets going, and they'd catch the fish, and I'm just Yeah, going. but in fact, they catch the idiots. Yeah. So not the fast one, which are, not yeah, the fast well, and the good ones. It's so. called thinning the herd. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, as fish, come yeah, on. Yeah, as fish. As I a know. fish. So when the family comes together in the evening and says, yeah, he will be catched by a fisherman, which a net. So even not from a shark, come on, that, that is not a good death. That's, no. that's not a good thing. And uh, also that the people, the, the people saying in, in Europe, it's, it's a big deal, that they're saying, yeah, we can keep the fish in the reef. Where's his place? And I try to explain them, if a fisherman has a fish, it will not come back. Right. It's only the question if he can live in an aquarium, so they gain more money that they can take the kids to school or they will eat it. Right, and if they can't eat it and they can't sell it, it has no value, so they don't take care of it. Yeah. It's, there's a reason there's no shortage of cows. Cows have value, so we have zillions of them. 
if the reef has value to these islanders and these people that are working on the reef, they take care of it because it has value to them. It's human nature. You take care of things that have value. That's what we do. You yeah. destroy things that have no value to you. Yeah. And nobody understands that. By protecting this and taking care of them, nobody cares about these corals more than us hobbyists do. We try to learn. We can't sleep at night when our tanks are bad. You know, it's just like if our dog's sick. We can't sleep maybe, at night. It's maybe you can't sleep mean, meanwhile. I can't sleep when my tanks are bad. She knows that. Uh, maybe when the alarm is going off at 1.30 at night, so then... The dog also wakes me up at 1.30 and it does not make a sound for her. It makes a grrrr and I go and take it out and she sleeps through it. So it's the same way with the alarm. She sleeps through the dog every, and the alarm. Every aquarist dream is at night waking up and you hear drops. Tick, tick. No. I, or you hear an alarm. And immediately you wake up and on 180, what's going, yeah. what's going on? <laughs> no, my, my pumps are, have a level on it yeah. downstairs. The pump is shut off twice. I've taken the dogs out at 2 o'clock. The pump's shut off. I got downstairs, have to get everything restarted. Try to go back to sleep after you've set up a pump for half an hour. You don't go back to sleep. You just lay in bed going, oh. It's so, but why do we make this? Why do I make the alarms? To make no, sure. No, why do we make this? So why we come to this hobby, which spend us so much time, we, we have always feared that something happens, and you know it happens It always all happens, the particularly time. if you go on vacation, it always happens. Yeah. So why are we doing it? I worked in oncology for 40 years, yeah. and I basically tried to work to save people's lives. And I worked with people that were stressed all day about saving people's lives. We were always good friends. And when I came home, and I stuck my hands in the tank, and I played with the tank, no matter what happened, I forgot about all the death and all the stress of the day. I could feel my blood pressure come down. I could feel myself relax. Now I've gotten to the point where a lot of times I can sit in that chair at night. I look at this blue tank and these colorful corals and these happy fish. I can go upstairs and go right to sleep because this helps me to relax. And with goldfish not possible? No. <laughs> I, I need to see the behavior. That's why I have saltwater versus freshwater. The freshwater fish tank I have is nice. Yeah. The fish do this. Root, root. They don't have any behavior. They're not very bright. Oh, the yellow tank also do that. No, this yellow tank has personality. He's been with me for a dozen years. But these fish are in school. The uh, flame hawks form a pair and swim oh, around. It? The uh, antheus, we not, the male we, biomaculatus. We cannot get them actually due to this Hawaiian ban. Oh, you can get them from uh, uh, Marshall Islands. Yeah. Yeah. To Europe, there are so many flights yeah. coming from Marshall during COVID time. You know? Oh, yeah. So every no, but day. there's the two of them. They've been in here for uh, four years. Oh, we they see hang them long together. times, never. Yeah. So for you, what do you think uh, about the future, so about the now, what we have achieved over the time, and uh, what do you think about the next future, the next five, ten years? What will happen with the reef keeping for us, and what is the good thing, maybe? Well, there? looking from where we've come to where we are, yeah. where we can keep just about every animal alive, whether it's a non-photosynthetic corals or Acropora, which when I started, the heads of the public aquarium here tried to get them banned in the U.S. because they said no one can keep them. <laughs> but we were keeping them as hobbyists, and a lot of what we did as hobbyists was shared with the public aquarium, was shared with everyone. That's one of the other bright spots. Now, basically, everyone shares with everyone. Through the Internet, through Facebook, through Instagram, through everything, everybody can see my tank. Everybody can see what you're doing. That's a big help. There's now yeah. over 2 million people with saltwater tanks in their house worldwide. When you and I started, there were literally a handful in the U.S. when I started doing this. I never thought this would get to the point where there were over 2 million people in the world with not a saltwater this, tank. Not at this time. No, not this, this quickly. Happens. Yeah, yeah because everybody, as you said, it's beautiful to look at. The fish are interesting. We can keep everything alive. We have a lot better technology. Uh, there's ICP testing. There's management and understanding of the light. You can change and, and, and target the light exactly how you want it. Set up a template that's absolutely perfect for the corals that you keep. There's better nutrition for the fish. I mean, whenever I started, we were basically feeding the fish brine shrimp, frozen brine shrimp. They didn't do too well over a long, a long time. Mm -hmm. Now there's every kind of food. There's medicated food. Uh, I think we're getting a better understanding of coral diseases and how to manage them. We're yeah, looking, pests. <laughs> yeah, and pests. Yeah. We're looking at the microbiomes around the corals and try to make sure that the environment around the coral, when I say around the coral, I mean within the first couple millimeters, is perfect for that coral, that we're not stressing it. We understand the need for stability. We now have monitoring devices that allow us to keep the corals much more stable. 
But the, the, the one thing I worry about is a lot of the fun of the hobby. A lot of people in the U.S. don't have as much fun doing this. I still have a blast doing this. I still love talking to people. I still love writing about it. And I still love having all these tanks and putzing around with them. I mean, I'm going to do something crazy in a couple weeks. I'm getting rid of this old 10-year-old stand because it's starting to, it's wood and it's going to break. And I'm putting in this new stand that I just saw. That will take a whole day to do. Most people won't take a whole day to take down something that's thriving, take it apart, move it, put it back together, because in the long run, I'm looking at this as the long run. That's the one problem I have with people that are getting in the hobby now. They often look at this as a TV set, where they plug it in, 10 minutes later it's their favorite shows on. Go, yeah. That's not how this works. Yeah, but ICP and such technology brings them in this direction, you know? It my, helps them in this direction, yeah, but, but they have to concern, develop it on their own that this is a long-term patient hobby rather than we can just turn it on and boop, everything's perfect. My concern is a little bit more as how more technology we give, how more ideas and information we give. I see sometimes the feeling go, go to, to wipe back. So, and um, for me, it's a little bit same like a kitchen. So you can buy the best kitchen, whatever you want. It says absolutely not that you can cook. And that's something where you need, a still today, you need the feeling about which fish are put together, which course I stay to this, to this together. And this is for me a little bit missing according to the information, according to this, because there we go to a huge aquarium. He said, hey, I dose this product, and immediately people are running around and buying that. But it has nothing to do but with that, the success. But that's been the way the hobby has been since the beginning, where it's been anecdotal. Somebody that's an influencer says, I'm doing this. You have a perfectly beautiful tank, and you say, hey, Joe's adding this. i got to add it, too. That's what has to stop in the hobby, is immediately jumping from one thing, always trying to make it better. I'm one of the worst people at that. It has taken me a long time to accept that's the stupid way of doing this hobby. Oh, I lost a lot of animals, so I, I learned it fast. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've learned it uh, probably over 30 years. But I've realized, just keeping things stable, not adding the, the latest fad, not following the latest anecdotal evidence, and just keeping things stable. And if I want to change something, doing it very gradually yeah. over a long length of time. And, and get it, the feeling for it. Yeah. So that's that's the, the most thing which I, which I tell all the time is, hey, when you come from work or whatever, sit down and look in yep. and let it, let it flow for half an hour, for one hour. And that's how I do it. Every Sunday I go to my core farm. I put the music, mostly so loud that everybody can hear around in the city that I'm here. And then I play around with the core. Sometimes I clean them, sometimes I look for some pests or whatever. But then, so half an hour, one hour later, I get a feeling, it seems, hmm. I think I do that now. And that's mostly right, not right. the first idea. Right. And like I say, for me, it's like cooking. So if, if, you, if you can cook, nice. You don't need a, a, a thermometer, you don't need a clock. You know exactly, and ah, now it's time to bring it out of the oven. You know it. Yeah, So exactly. You feeling, look at your tank, you go, okay, this tank's We cannot good. give the people feeling. Right. We can try to explain technology. Right. We can build a nice kitchen. But we cannot teach him how to cook. Right. So, and that's the big difference between a carpenter who, who builds up a kitchen. He takes the kitchen. You will not go half a year later to him and say, hey, what my wife cooks is, is not good. So, and blaming for the kitchen. In right. the reef hobby is the guy who built the tank will be blamed half a year later when the, when the cores are, are not well. Right. And that's a really a huge difference. And these guys who build up a aquarium the things they have a really hard job for it because it's not finished with the build up so the most people think then okay uh, uh do you help me then till it's a nice reef tank but w what they can do they have no no possibility to give the feeling to these guys right no. that, it, you get this over time yeah yes. Yep. Content. We've got more than 50 minutes. Yeah. Okay. If it's okay so we'll finish it for so now. Yeah, we'll finish it. <laughs> Claude, always so, a pleasure. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet you and to come here and to also with your love, to see your lovely wife there, the whole family and the dog. So that's the best <laughs> thing that is worth to come here to the US, about 8,000 kilometers. We fly. And no, it was a really pleasure. 
Yep. Over here and now we go visiting a store. Now we're going to go visit a store. And there we show our European guys how uh, good. What a good U US store. What a really like. good US store showed yesterday. We were in another, for two days ago, we were in, in another store. Um, if it's quite good, uh, yeah, I'm friendly. It was a nice store. Yeah. <laughs> but now we go to a good store. <laughs> we'll see which one you like more. See what people from the US can buy there. Yep. Many thanks for your time. This time was a bit, little bit longer, but we're such a famous guy there, so I will keep my time and hope you get some nice information. So till later, bye-bye, and have a good time. Bye-bye.